Uh, Audrey Tang became Taiwan's digital minister almost to the day two years ago. Uh, first digital minister uh, in Taiwan, one of the few anywhere in the world, and uh, we believe the only transgender minister, or at least the first one anywhere on the planet. Audrey Tang led Taiwan's first e-rulemaking project. Here we get into the things I don't understand so well. Uh, well, this I do. She serves on the Taiwan National Development Council's Open Data Committee, and she is its K-12 Curriculum Committee uh, uh, leader. Uh, if you're wondering what sort of background is required to uh, become a digital minister somewhere, Audrey Tang's road has taken her via Apple, uh, although uh, not physically. We just learned she was actually never in Cupertino, but, but worked for Apple uh, anyhow on computational linguistics. Uh, she was at the Oxford University Press, where her work was on crowd lexicography, and at Social Text, where she did social interaction design. Uh, all impressive stuff. And then one other interesting piece from the bio that's not in your programs, junior high school dropout. So go figure. Uh, Audrey Tang will give a brief presentation here uh, and then be joined by Danny Russell, who uh, members and visitors here will know, Vice President for International Security and Diplomacy here at the Asia Society Policy Institute. Danny Russell served most recently uh, in government as Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs. He also served as the, at the White House as Special Assistant to the President during the Obama Administration and National Security Council, Council Senior Director for Asian Affairs. Um, we are on the record. Again, welcome to those watching via the webcast. Uh, the Twitter hashtag, if you are so inclined, is uh, Asia Society Live. Please, a warm welcome to the Asia Society here from Taipei, Digital Minister Audrey Tang. Um, hello, everyone. Very, very happy to be here. Um, and let's see if this clicker thing works. Oh, it does. That's great. So, yeah. Um, so thank you for the uh, excellent introduction. I worked with Apple, not for Apple. This is a very important distinction, um, as I uh, currently work with the Taiwan government, but not for the Taiwan government. And you will see why uh, in a few slides. Um, in, in any case, um, so I, my talk today is about digital social innovation. Um, so unlike many people today who work in Asia on democracy, on furthering democracy, I'm an optimist. And this strange condition uh, began when I was 15 years old. And that was 1996. And I discovered that the future of human knowledge is being created on the wild web, and my textbooks were all out of date. So I told my teachers I want to drop out of high school and start my education on the wild web. And surprisingly, all my teachers agreed with it. And then on the wild web, I discovered this wonderful community called the Internet Society that has a very strange idea of governance. Uh, it's called Rough Consensus, Radical Transparency, where anyone can join. It's an open, multi-stakeholder system. And that's the first democratic governance system that I know. It will be another six years before I get my first voting right. So that is my tribe. And what I'm doing now is to take the lessons I learned when I was 15 years old to the governance system. And this corresponds very neatly to the Sustainable Development Goals, because in 1718, 1717, and 1706, we talk about the idea of people working on common goals that are pre-agreed, but not so much on the pathways on how to get to the goals. So of utmost importance is that people understand the available data, the evidence, what their actions influence the environmental and social um, you know, uh, spillovers and things like that in order to encourage trustworthy and effective partnership. And in fact, that is what a digital minister in Taiwan, um, my mandate is to do, is through open government and social innovation and youth engagement to make sure that people can have a meaningful input. And the um, values of Taiwan, the plural part is the important part, um, comes from the inauguration speech our president gave uh, two and a half years ago. She said, before, uh, democracy was often understood as clash between two opposing values, but now, Taiwan's democracy must become a conversation between diverse, a plurality of values. And that we took as our guiding um, idea, guiding philosophy. So in the previous century, governance systems were often thought of as people who organize among, for example, people interested in environment and people interested in development through different agencies, different councils, and 
among this organization kind of arbitrate um, through them and into some sort of compromise uh, in the middle position. But that governance structure, that system is kind of bankrupt after the advent of social media and of a hyper-connected world because people don't need the or uh, government to organize themselves anymore with the right hashtag. Tens of thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people just organize out of nowhere. And it is impossible for the government or indeed the legislation to set up new committees for each and every emerging issue. So we'll find ourselves kind of uh, in a lot of tension if we still want to govern the old-fashioned way. And and so digital governance or co collaborative governance learns from the internet society and asks a different set of questions instead of how should we organize people and what is fair between those organized people. We now ask, so we have different positions. What are some of our common values that we can agree with? And if we can agree on some com common values, can we deliver innovations that works for everyone? If we, the government keeps asking these two questions, various other interests that seem to be in opposition with each other will soon come into consensus. And I will use one particular example that I personally participated in and that some legislators here have participated in as well. So four years ago in Taiwan, there was a demonstration. It's a demonstration in the sense of a demo of showing how to do something, not in violent protest. Uh, it was around the uh, uh, MPs at the time refusing to deliberate substantially a cross-strait service and trade act or the CSSTA. And since the MPs were kind of on strike, the people just went and occupied the parliament and did MPs work for them. That's the legitimacy theory. Uh, and basically, we, we experimented how to use civic technology to enable anyone working with over 20 NGOs, each tackling the CSSTA from a different angle, to just type in their company name or the trade they're doing and know exactly how they will be impacted by CSSTA and have real substantial dialogue around it. And it's called the Sunflower Movement. It is a quiet, silent, nonviolent revolution that nevertheless shaped how Taiwan people perceive politics as something that people can substantially contribute without waiting for the government to organize. And supporting the Sunflower Occupy was this movement called Gov Zero or G Zero V that started two years before the Occupy in 2012. And the Gov Zero movement, which I'm a part of, um, is this radical new idea called forking the government. Forking in computer science means taking something that's already there, that's going into one direction and going off to another direction while relinquishing, abandoning the copyright so that it could be merged back into the original um, brand. And so GovZero systematically look it at each and every government services, like our legislation is ly.gov.tw, right? Like our um, executive UN is ey.gov.tw. Every website ends in gov.tw. And the movement says, if there's something in the service, in the public service that you don't like, well, you can go off and make your own version by changing a O to a zero. So the GovZero's shadow government version of the legislation is ly.g0vtw, and so on. And so basically, you don't have to Google for our work. You just go to any government website, change your O to a zero, and get into the shadow government. Uh, <laughs> it's all open source, open data, interactive, and so on. And this is the inaugural. Uh, project of Gov Zero budget G Zero VTW because back then people found budget the national administration's budget 500 pages PDF very difficult to understand so the Gov Zero people using the same data build a visualization where you can zoom in to the keywords to the topic areas you care about and have a real conversation among people interested in the same areas and because they abandoned the copyright so this year we merge all this work into the national administration so that for more than 13 hundred ministerial projects. You can see the KPIs, the procurements, the research proposals, anything associated with those 13 different projects and ask any questions and have a career public servant and have a real dialogue on that particular budget item as a social object. So this demonstrates one of the ways that the civil society can just fork of a uh, public sector service and have the public service merge back their contributions. And so the GovZero communities using this 
ethos supported the occupiers back then and based on this idea of free software. And in Taiwan, when we say free software or zio ran qi, uh, we always mean free as in freedom, uh, not as in beer, because we know that, <laughs> because we know that, that freedom is never free. Our, our parents' generation, our grandparents' generation paid dearly for the freedom of association, of assembly, of speech, and we have to keep using the free software to keep it free, which is why we always only use the free and open software for this kind of endeavor. And so um, during the Occupy, the uh, main way that we did the deliberation on the street and also recording it online uh, is called the focused conversation method. It's invented in Canada about 12 years ago. Uh, it separates a discussion into four stages, the facts or objective stage where people gather around um, evidence that are not disputed by any party. And very importantly, the feeling stage where for a while we talk about nothing but each other's feelings and checking in on each other's feelings and make sure that the feelings are properly resonating within the people who attended the Occupy or the discussion before we move on to ideas. And the best ideas are the ideas that takes care of the most people's feelings. And so the decisions uh, then is easy, just to take the ideas that are you know, self-coherent and check with the stakeholders, and then we can make it into law. And this is called crowd law. There's hundreds of uh, like events that we did, the crowd law campaign pain and things like that, and you can just Google for crowd law and find a catalog of the hundreds of attempts that we did in, in conjunction with uh, communities around the world. And because of time, I don't have time to show all the four steps, I would just show the feelings part. So for example, back in 2015, uh, we used AI-powered conversation called Polis, it's an open software, to talk about this idea of UberX, or um, people without a professional driver's license carry passengers and charging them for it. Uh, just on this neutral description, we spent three months with all the stakeholders to make sure it doesn't offend anyone and everybody is welcome to join. And so we send this link to everybody on their mobile phone and just in one glance, they can see what their friends and families, their Twitter friends, their Facebook friends stunned on this issue of UberX. And so to express their um, feelings, basically they look at their friends and families and other people's citizens' uh, feelings. Like, I feel that passenger liability insurance should be mandatory for riders of UberX private vehicles. And they can agree or disagree to resonate or not on this statement. And as they press agree or disagree, their avatar, the blue circle, moves in the crowd to identify the tribe or the cluster that they identify with. We don't look at the numbers here, we're just measuring the diversity of possible feelings and reactions. And the magical thing is that because we don't jump to solutions, we just check in with each other's feelings, and there is no reply button, so there is no room for trolls to, to perform. Uh, <laughs> right? There, it, it's impossible to troll this system. All you can do is to propose more nuanced, more eclectic feelings for other people to resonate with. And so after three weeks, we always find the participation something like this. To the right are the divisive statements that people generally agree to disagree. But people spend far more time and far more energy on the left, which are the consensus statements that the ministries hold themselves to account. We agree to respond point by point to anything that resonates across the aisle, across the population. And so people compete still, but they compete for resonance, they compete for feelings that represent the most people's feelings. And then we meet with each stakeholders one by one in a live stream session, checking with them. Here are the common feelings of people. Do you agree? If you do, is there something that you can do to help furthering these feelings? If not, why? And so on this uh, way, the interpretation or ideas become very feasible because it's based on common goals and common feelings. And so we set up the public digital innovation space as part of my mandate in 2016 to scale this conversation. Uh, we both scale out, as in teaching the municipalities internationally on how to run the system. We scale up by giving it more binding power uh, through e-petition and so on, which I'll talk about, and deeply by having in our K-12 education and our high education this kind of consensus making as capstone uh, projects for people to focus on environmental and social issues as part of their uh, basic and higher education. 
And so I'm a uh, radically transparent digital minister. So all the uh, meetings that I hold, that I chair, I publish a full transcript after editing for professionalism and taking out some in-jokes. And then we publish online um, two weeks um, to the day uh, after each uh, meeting. So you can see hundreds of meetings. And anyone can ask me questions, including journalists, but they don't get exclusive answers. The answers need to be shared with everybody. And also, this is uh, Mr. David Plouffe speaking for Uber at the time. So lobbyists are subject to the same uh, standards. Uh, and it's not just on the record. It's on 360 uh, recording record. So anyone of you can just put on a VR and relive the conversation. And I think that this is very important so that the other stakeholders see Uber not as a nameless, faceless thing, but we actually regulated uh, Uber. You can now call Uber legally, and it can call taxis through the apps and so on. It, they're in a symbiotic relationship now, uh, so people can have their feelings checked also by the stakeholders' feelings as captured by the radical transparency records. And so to make sure that all the career public service is in line with this kind of work to reduce their fear, uncertainty, and doubt, we introduced the idea of POs or participation office. There are a team of people in each and every ministries by national regulation that their job is just to engage with people with emerging views online before they take to the street. And their job, very simply put, is to meet monthly and talk about the emerging issues that we should proactively engage the civil society with. And because it's a virtual team, it's literally like 60, 70 people now, uh, but we share the same virtual workplace. And so people generally consider each ministry's uh, reliable partner in cases like this. So there's no silo effect just by the virtue of going through 40 or so cases. And so for each petition, for example, the one on the right is the petitioner last May who petitioned saying the tax filing system is explosively hostile to the users. Uh, and so it's purely negative energy. There is no useful information in his petition. And basically, uh, we look at the, you know, the people who commented, and 80% of which are just saying, you know, we should, you know, the Minister of Finance should resign or something like that. Um, it's, it's not very helpful. Uh, <laughs> but because of the participation office and network, we just sent an invitation who, to everyone who complained publicly, saying, so two weeks from now, everybody who complained, just by the virtue of you posting a complaint, are cordially invited to the Ministry of Finance to co-create with the participation offices the next year's tax filing experience. And just like that, the, the wind has changed. And uh, everybody after words, their posts, it's 80% of it are constructive criticisms. They are actually uh, offering their professional help. And so we had very successful four co-creation workshops that together with people who complained <laughs> on the right hand side, they, they just get invited into the kitchen and become chefs or co-chefs and totally redesign our text filing system this year, which has a 96% approval rating. And the other 4%, of course, still understand that their input will be taken into consideration in a fully radical transparent way for next year's text filing experience. And so these are some of the ways that we're trying to get people who, who commit to different sides of the SDG uh, into the center, which is innovation to the common values, to the good of everyone. And the place we hold collaboration workshops, I must show it to you, is my office uh, in Taipei City. Uh, it's called the Social Innovation Lab uh, within the Taipei uh, Contemporary Culture Lab, or C-Lab. And this was collaboratively designed by hundreds of social innovators. That soccer field was drawn by people with Down syndrome. And it turns out they're brilliant artists. Uh, and so <laughs> I'm, I'm here like every Wednesday from 10 AM to 10 PM. Anyone can come to talk to me as long as they agree to have the conversation published on the internet. So rough sleepers, social workers, people working on social impact, they can just come to me. And it's not just. They come to me, I also come to them. So every other Tuesday or so, I tour around Taiwan, going to rural places, indigenous places, and so on, uh, to the left. And then people can dial in through video conference. But anytime I go there to do this kind of investigative journalist or ethnographic research, uh, the 12 ministries related to social innovation are standing by right there on the social innovation lab to the right, so that anyone on the field asking, why is you know ministry, whatever, uh, 
introducing something that we don't feel here, uh, they can give a real back and forth conversation through teleconference and video conference, and the other 11 ministries then learn that, oh, so this is to be resolved in this way. And because of radical transparency, people just co-create a social inno uh, innovation plan that uh, basically says the SDGs are the common index. We're going to index all our work, that the basic and higher education need to index this as part of their capstone and university uh, social responsibility programs, and our Ministry of Foreign Affairs joined for the first time to offer this as kind of international help. So because of time, I'll just use one last example. Um, when I was touring around Taiwan, I found many people caring a lot about the air quality in Taiwan. So they set up all those very low cost measurement devices on PM 2.5 and other air quality issues in their balcony, in their schools, in their homes. And the interesting thing is it's entirely grassroots. It's 2,000 or so of points by the time I learned about it. And it's one Gov Zero uh, project. And they wish the Environmental Protection Agency can complement their work. In any other place in Asia, the government will feel threatened in legitimacy. But in Taiwan, we just join the civil society by committing uh, to set up the places where they don't have the measurement devices, by helping co calibrating their devices, uh, by producing more high precision devices for them, and also developing algorithms to weed out the noise. But at the end, what we committed to is the civil IoT project at ci.taiwan.taiwan.gov.tw that aggregates all the water quality, air quality, um, earthquake prediction, disaster relief data, everything into the same super high computing center. And for the civil society's contributions to be snapshotted and stored on distributed ledgers so they know that the government will not change the numbers the day before the election. Uh, and so people have general <laughs> trust about distributed ledgers that we can hold ourselves into account no matter where the sensor and the data came from. And this is how we can then develop the evidence-based like climate change and other action plans with other people in other communities without bilateral, multilateral pacts. It's just people discovering these open source platforms and making use of it. And so uh, finally, I would like to read you my job description. Because two years ago when I joined, I don't have a contract. I had a compact or a covenant uh, with the government. Uh, and my working conditions are voluntary association. I don't give or take command. Um, that is radical transparency. Anything I see, I can publish. But I don't see any state secrets. And location independence. Anywhere I am, I am in my office. And so with these three, Covenants, they asked me to write a job description of what I'm going to do. And so I wrote them a poem about my job description, uh, which is my, kind of my vision about digital social innovation. And it's, it goes like this. When we see Internet of Things, let's make it an Internet of Beings. When we see virtual reality, let's make it a shared reality. When we see machine learning, let's make it collaborative learning. When we see user experience, let's make it about human experience. And whenever we hear that the singularity is near, let us always remember the plurality is here. Thank you so much. Minister. Audrey, thank you so, so much. That has to rank as the world's best job description. <laughs> <laughs> Blown away. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, what, a f what a great treat and what a fun uh, presentation. Uh, remind you that we're on the record. Uh, the minister and I will talk for a while and and we'll open it up to questions from the room as well as from the great beyond. Uh, let me ask or remind you all who are brandishing uh, phones to set them to stun so they don't actually ring while we're talking. Now, at the beginning of uh, your presentation, Audrey, uh, when you said, let me see if I can get this clicker thing to work, mm -hmm. I, I felt great relief wash over me and thought, okay. I can relate to that feeling. <laughs> maybe, maybe this will be at a technological level that I can handle. Uh, and in fact, your presentation was uh, very lucid, and I thank you for that. But I wonder if I can start in keeping with your job description uh, with the being uh, part of it, with the human part of it. 
and talk a little bit about who Audrey Tang is. And you've had such an extraordinary journey, one that's marked not just by innovation, but by tremendous personal mm -hmm. courage. And you told us at lunch, as Tom mentioned, that you had left school, uh, junior high school. Right. I know you went, uh, however briefly, to California when mm -hmm. you were only 19. Yeah. You, uh, as you alluded to, were a, a very active participant in mm -hmm. the Sunflower Movement. Mm -hmm. You made the uh, huge step of coming out as a woman. Mm -hmm. Uh, and you've got a compact with the, with the government, with yes. the administration, mm -hmm. uh, that allows you to do these incredible things. Who are you? What, mm. what, 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 what drives you? What are some of the, mm. the principles that make you, that have taken you in this mm. fascinating and valuable direction? Well, um, more factoids. Uh, I live with six cats, uh, <laughs> and uh, I'm a, really a cat lover. Part of the reason why I voted for Dr. Tsai when she ran for president. Uh, she's a fellow cat lover. Um, and, uh, really, she, she's really progressive, even in her progressive party, um, in, in terms of marriage equality and also environmental protection, animal welfare, and animal rights, even, um, and, and things like indigenous rights and things like that. So. Um, personally, I think my journey is that of you know going through two puberties, going through a long period of living mostly with um, animals and also with the indigenous language community, trying to revitalize their identity in a very Han ethnic centric uh, society and so on. I think the the overarching theme is what we call intersectionality, which is a big word I know, but <laughs> the idea is that I have some vulnerable parts, uh, parts that I suffered when I was being bullied when I was eight years old and things like that. So I can relate to the part that are vulnerable in each of us who suffer social injustice. But on the other hand, I also have this empathy part, which allow me to relate more to people's live-in experiences mm -hmm. and organize these into words, into movements, into poetry. And so by combining the organizational part and the vulnerable part, this intersectionality allows me to be a channel uh, upon which the people who are suffering from environmental or social injustice can amplify their messages through me and then reaching a you know common understanding and with the career public service and what we can do together as a society well, well thank you for that so just to be clear your six cats are all carbon-based mammals yeah, right? none of them are digital. They're, they're not crypto <laughs> kittens on the <laughs> ethereum blockchain yeah. I have some data of that just, as well yeah <laughs> just checking okay uh, so what I think what I'm hearing is that your your own experience, your life experience, and mm -hmm. your experience as a transgender mm -hmm. woman is mm -hmm. germane mm -hmm. to your focus on good governance, collaborative governance, mm -hmm. open governance, yes. the, the the freedoms that you've mm -hmm. been championing. Yeah, the the word I use to describe is scalable listening or listening at scale. Um, because with sufficient time, two people can always kind of merge their horizons to reach some level of understanding. But the existing technologies before the internet, radio and television, makes it too easy for one person to speak to millions of people, but very difficult to listen to millions of people, let alone having millions of people to listen to one another. And the internet can change that, but only in a very humble, very calm, very ambient kind of way that makes us focus on each other's life experience more instead of it distracts us away with notifications or manufacturing addiction or things like that, which is where the digital governance uh, thing is focused on and how Taiwan is shaping our strategy around AI and data and distributed ledgers. So could you talk a little more about how you see uh, technology uh, influencing and impacting on social issues mm -hmm. in in Taiwan uh, in advancing equal mm -hmm. rights I know that there for example the um, the law on same-sex marriage is mm -hmm. uh, still kind of percolating or yeah it's constitutionally recognized it's just uh, at the end of the year we're going to have a few referendums about the exact weddings like whether to use the word marriage or not uh, but the right the same right has been recognized by the uh, constitutional court so um, I'm interested in in your view of how 
technology mm -hmm. has in fact impacted? That's one example. That's, Are there others? Yes. Um, so in Taiwan, when uh, Dr. Tsai talked about in her campaign broadband as a human right, uh, many other governments say it, but Taiwan has a unique geography that let us actually deliver it. Um, <clears throat> where we're well on the way there now. So anywhere in Taiwan or in any of the islands, pescadores and so on, if you don't have broadband internet connection, it's always the government's fault. So <coughs> we think it's a great equalizer if everybody have access to the same high-speed AI computing devices that I just mentioned for all the high school students be able to correlate their activities with the air and water quality of around their schools. It would be a great unequalizer if only some people have access to the connectivity and the computing power. And so basically it's all very driven by equality, about respecting the local cultural needs and social needs, and about making the education, at least in the K-12, but also more and more in higher education, to participate in what we call the open source based way of education. So they're using hardware that we call it Arduino or Raspberry Pi, that are hardware that anyone can make themselves without paying a patent or royalty fee. Same goes for software, same goes for cybersecurity, same goes for many other um, pieces that make technology work. And the end goal is to just to disenchant or demystify technology itself so that every child can feel that they own the technology, that personal computer remains personal and not something that they have to subscribe to. Um, Audrey, what about the other end of the spectrum, mm -hmm. the older people, the yes. Luddites, the, mm -hmm. and the people, whether it's uh, uh, the rural populations or the mm. less educated mm. in societies who tend to be left behind mm -hmm. by technological innovation. Mm -hmm. How do you enfranchise them with your programs? Yes. Um, so uh, I think we should not ask them to come to technology. We should go to them with technology. And so in the e-petition platform, for example, there's two cases where it's strictly local. There's a South Italian Taiwan popular tourist destination called Hengchun, and they petition for a helicopter to be stationed there to serve as ambulance cars because they're just too far away, 90 minutes drive from a major hospital. And so because of this a strictly local issue, all the five different different ministries, their participation offices, we all went to Hengchun and have a real conversation with the people there. And the technique we use, very simply put, is that there is a room where stakeholders have a more expert conversation. And in the town hall, which is me, we watch the live stream of the conversation that's happening on the screen, but me serving as kind of an ESPN anchor, uh, describing in lay language, in Taiwanese halak, uh, what, what, what does this play even mean uh, to the local people. And the local people, all they have to do is to walk to the town hall or to join you through instant messaging or whatever. And some people do protest because where I am, there's SNG, there's reporters, but because it's not live streamed back to the deliberation room, it doesn't disrupt the actual discussion from happening. Mm -hmm. And whenever people make constructive criticisms or ideas or whatever, I bring it back through a kind of channeling device back to where the mind map is growing in the people there. So people perceive the people outside not as you know protesters or mobs or whatever, but actually active contributors to the mind map they're mapping. So at the end of it, we agreed the common value is that people should trust their local clinicians more. And so we allocate a lot of fund to build a new hospital where we can fly doctors in instead of flying patients out. Interesting. Um, what are some of the points of resistance that you are encountering to uh, elements of this set of programs, whether it's JOIN or V Taiwan or Open Government? Who's pushing back? Mm -hmm. Mostly it's the career public service who initially thought it is something extra to do, something that they don't have much credit. The minister would take all the credit if things go well, and if things go wrong, they're always to blame, and so on. So when I went into the cabinet, the PEDIS, the my office, is deliberately one person from each ministry. I'm allowed to poach one person from each ministry. So theoretically, I can have 32 staff. Now I have 22. But on, anyway, it is a truly multi-stakeholder team. I don't give them command. So anything that PETAS does, it is to the benefit of all the 22 ministries involved. And because of that, people start to see with radical transparency, career public service actually gets a lot of credit because 
Previously, they proposed some very good ideas, but the ministry just say no to each of them, so they never see the light of day. Because in Taiwan's Freedom of Information Act, I'm sure in other countries as well, before people reach a decision in the government, we are not we're not compelled to publish the drafting stage, the back and forth within the ministry agencies. But because I said anything I can see, I can publish. So actually, the Korea Public Service gets a lot of credit for communicating with civil society with innovative ideas. Because it's so radically new, if things go wrong, it's always my fault. So people, <laughs> people in the Korean Public Service learn that they can innovate and propose ideas that even have just 5% chance of succeeding and having me absorbing most of the risk or having the president herself through presidential hackathons and things, activities like that. We have cross-sectoral collaborations that basically the Korea Public Service writes the entries, give it to the civil society people who enters the competition, and they say, OK, we're just here to help the civil society. But actually, they wrote the cases themselves. And so every uh, year, we select five cases. And there's no prize money, no reward in monetary uh, terms. But rather, the prize of winning the presidential hackathon is to be merged into the Korea Public Service, our annual budget, the very next year. Mm, wow, fascinating. Well, you're sitting next to a lapsed uh, career public servant, mm. so I appreciate your <laughs> forbearance. Yeah. Um, and in my own uh, career in government, uh, I found on many issues, certainly issues dealing with national security mm -hmm. and international relations, mm -hmm. that it was important that the internal deliberative mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. uh, remain confidential. Uh, mm -hmm. That was key to not only protecting mm -hmm. certain national security of uh, sets of information, mm -hmm. but also creating an environment where there was the willingness mm -hmm. to uh, innovate, to experiment, yes. to contradict, to challenge mm -hmm. the conventional wisdom. Yes. How do you maintain, uh, setting aside national security information, mm -hmm. how do you maintain the willingness of uh, the team to take a risk with an idea that may instantly be shown to be a bad idea or try something that runs against the grain of what's current mm -hmm. or popular. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you protect that space for mm -hmm. really open and honest yes. internal discussion? Um, quite a few mains. If I had to uh, go in with radical transparency in a live camera, I would get nowhere, right? So when I talk about publishing the transcript two weeks after each meeting, every participant is allowed to edit. And people who feel there is a power imbalance usually choose to appear as nicknames. So that if things go wrong, you don't know who, mm. which public service a member there is. If things go right, they can come to the journalists and say, hey, I proposed okay. that. <laughs> so it's best of both worlds. Uh, and also, but still, on the national security um, aspect, my radical transparency compact says I don't look at anything that is state secret, anything that is top secret or confidential. So we don't know. Uh, we don't know how that will interact with national security matters. So far, it's mostly about domestic matters. So I uh, get that you're setting, uh, you're cordoning off the national security, mm -hmm. uh, sensitive information, and so on. Uh, but there are other forms of uh, cyber crime, of uh, challenges to mm -hmm. the security of systems, the mm -hmm. integrity of, a, yes. of, a, of an administrative process. How do you, have you had mm -hmm. problems? Are th have you had the... So, of being yeah, um, I'm going to talk geek for, her for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> like, like my first action as the digital minister is to recompile the Linux kernel uh, used in the government uh, systems. Recompiling the kernel is a technical term. That means uh, we use the secured, peer-reviewed, open source operating system um, to harden the security of our internal communication tools. Because if the public service, in the 14 days of editing, the journalist gets you know, most of the copy, then it would destroy the trust that the Korea Public Service placed on me. So I have to personally ensure the cybersecurity of the system that we use. And Aside from introducing, uh, the system is called Sandstorm, by the way, sandstorm.io. Aside from introducing that, we also commissioned top-notch 
white hat hackers, uh, people who are expert in computer security, won the second place internationally in DEF CON to attack the system. And this is not just some black box penetration testing. This whole system is open source, so they pour through each line looking for vulnerabilities, looking for security holes, and it's only after half a year of this white box testing that we're reasonably sure that this is okay against all the cybersecurity threats and that it has a full audit and so on so that people can innovate on top of this platform, which is why we use the same Google app-like uh, collaborative spreadsheet, collaborative document editing, the Kanban board, chat room, you name it, within this secure enclave so that Korea Public Service can just write a few pages of simple web programming to create a system for ordering lunch boxes together or something like that, uh, giving them the freedom to innovate without worrying about cybersecurity. Thanks. Well, so you've talked about cybersecurity, you've talked about safeguarding the, the code and the mm -hmm. system. Uh, what about safeguarding privacy? Mm -hmm. What are some of the other uh, concerns? Mm -hmm. Transparency, yes, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. on the other hand, uh, mm -hmm. how, do you, how, do, how do you calculate the mm -hmm. things that uh, could be put at risk by mm -hmm. this radical transparency? As I said, people uh, choose to record their um, utterances by voluntary association. So they only reveal the part of themselves or their speech that they're comfortable of revealing. Mm -hmm. So at an extreme example, I've had office hours where journalists interview me, but they change their mind about the question they ask. So in the transcript, you just see me answering questions, but all the questions are redacted. Um, and so it, in, in some extreme, it could be like that, which is funny. Usually, it's the other way around with journalists and ministers. But in any case, mm -hmm. um, we, we, we do allow people to basically edit away their uh, speeches and utterances if they feel their privacy is at risk. And I think as a general point, if people have informed consent of what they put out there in the public domain, we see data or private data as not an asset to anybody involved, but rather as the beginning of a real relationship. The GDPR from the European Union talks something like that. Uh, if you put data in the government storage, the government begins a relationship with you that you can ask the government to disclose what kind of purpose it's using, is it using out of purpose, what kind of update mechanism is there, can I take it to somewhere else to for storage and things like that, and Taiwan is totally in line with this kind of what we call data agency, um, you know, algorithms and attitudes. Great. Well, let me switch gears if I can a little mm -hmm. bit. Sure. Um, you talked a bit in your remarks about your own experience mm -hmm. in the Sunflower Movement, yes. and it, I lived through that movement from the vantage point of Washington D.C. Mm -hmm. since I was uh, working at the. National Security Council at mm -hmm. the time. And the developments and the progress or lack of progress mm -hmm. in the cross-strait relationship mm -hmm. uh, was then and will always be of mm -hmm. real importance mm -hmm. and uh, real interest to mm -hmm. policymakers in the United States mm -hmm. particularly, but elsewhere as well. The Sunflower Movement was not merely a protest about the fact that the members of the LY weren't at their desks and mm -hmm. doing what you wanted them to do. It was very much about the cross-trade uh, trade and services agreement itself. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about whether in any way there's, in your view, a, a sort of digital component mm. to the cross-trait relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does how, if at all, does your work, uh, these platforms, relate to uh, the dealings and the prospects of a, mm -hmm. the relationship between <coughs> Taiwan and the mainland. Right. <coughs> so just for the record, um, Sunflower Movement is not my idea at all. I, I, did not, <laughs> I did not know that it would happen. I was just called there to supply uh, the communication facility uh, of this protest that night. I have no idea that they will climb over the wall and break into it. And that uh, <laughs> the communication facility I thought I would just lend for a couple hours to ended up to be 22 days. So, so I had no idea. But in any case, um, yes, I, I think there is a 
uh, component of digital in this relationship. The example I showed, uh, the Airbox uh, or the G0V uh, air visualization platform, uh, many people in, for example, um, Shanghai or Beijing or Shenzhen or so on, really want to know what really is going on with the air quality there as well. Um, but just as you know why the Reporter Without Borders chose Taiwan as their headquarter in Asia, that's because they have a safe place in which to publish the results without worrying about retaliation from the government and so on. And so there is a lot of collaboration between the civil society focusing on water and air quality and the citizen scientists, well, across Asia, but of course in those cities, in PRCs as well, where they see Taiwan as somewhere that can safeguard their data and publish and contribute to the climate science without worrying about retaliation or revealing their identity there. And I think in that, I personally worked on the Freenet uh, platform uh, back in 2000 and 2001, and it was the precursor of the Tor platform, uh, which is widely used nowadays for people in uh, more restricted internet environments to safely voice their opinions and send their messages out to the international journalist uh, community. And so while I don't work personally on the same technologies now, I do um, maintain the same ethos and support the people who work on what well, is really SDG 16 as well, a accountable kind of rule of law uh, system where people can safely publish their evidences uh, that's related to their environment. Do you follow what uh, is occurring in uh, mainland China in terms of the harnessing and the application of AI, of mm -hmm. uh, technology in connection with uh, the Communist Party's own mm -hmm. uh, goals for mm -hmm. social control and social stability? Yeah, they're on a very different track. Yeah. Can you envisage uh, the, the kinds of innovative platforms and programs that you're uh, developing and applying uh, being adopted or integrated even at the local level uh, mm -hmm. in the PRC? Yeah, um, so people don't usually call themselves civic hackers uh, in the PRC for obvious reasons. Uh, they, they, or they, they, if they do, they <laughs> only get to use that once. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Yeah. Um, so, but they operate uh, under the umbrella, for example, of social enterprises and, and things of, uh, you know, still social but, you know, less, um, you know, threatening, uh, Monica. And we do offer through the Social Innovation Plan uh, basic trainings, basic know-hows of how to use these digital technologies, curriculums that we're building with the kind of Digital Nations Network and things like that. So all of these are available on the web. And the particular thing with our technology is that it's not reliant on us so-called cloud provider, uh, either Microsoft or Google or you know Amazon, it can be all be run on a very cheap, simple um, you know PC, and that powers the, the for example the Occupy. It was powered by intranet, uh, running just a, a couple laptops. And so I think this is important so that people can learn to self-organize. Maybe not in a political setting, maybe just in a social economic setting, but still understand that in the digital governance approach, it is possible to listen to millions of people. Mm -hmm. um, we talked about uh, cybersecurity. We talked a little bit about, uh, or we understand that you're setting aside mm -hmm. uh, the uh, state secrets, the yeah. state secrets, and mm -hmm. the confidential information. Mm -hmm. um, but where have you, where have you had problems? What what have been some of the issues? Does your own uh, role as a transgender woman mm -hmm. uh, generate pushback and controversy. Mm -hmm. Are some of the, uh, the policies that have been produced mm -hmm. through open government or some mm -hmm. of the issues that have surfaced through the, the Taiwan mm -hmm. and other platforms, mm -hmm. um, have they created uh, problems that perhaps you hadn't uh, foreseen? Many. Um, there was a e-petition, 8,000 people, that petitioned Taiwan to change our time zone from plus eight to plus nine. Uh, the media loved the story, <laughs> uh, all, like throughout the mainstream media. So immediately, almost, there's a petition of 8,000 people strong that says Taiwan should remain in GMT plus eight. Um, and so there's a lot of frenzy of buzz around mm -hmm. this. Um, so my methodology, again, is kind of 
when this kind of controversy happens. It's just focusing on the common values, as I said in the very beginning. So we did invite people who petitioned for both sides into co-creation workshops, where they both, uh, after a morning of very loud um, conversation, and also each ministry explaining exactly how much changing one hour would cost in terms of energy, in terms of tourism, in terms of everything. They had no idea that public service is very professional in every single way. Uh, and then they agreed the common value is that they want Taiwan to be seen as more unique internationally. Like we have some unique value proposition, some unique thing going on. But then even the original petition agreed that changing the time zone is perhaps not the best uh, way to further this goal. Because maybe the media will report it for the day. And then, I mean, there are countries with multiple time zones. There are countries with multiple currency systems. It's not a strong enough identity. And so people just say, you know, if, we, if we're going to pay a large one-time cost and a not so large but still sizable ongoing cost to implement this, why, why don't we use the same budget to make Taiwan unique in a way that's cultural, in a way that's open governance, digital governance, maybe Maybe we can export distance the system like Estonia does and things like that. And so it became the consensus of the, all the 16,000 people participating in the petition. So although there was controversy, but these were also people who can advocate for the rough consensus that we reached at the end. I see. Thanks. So I was, I was guessing that uh, maybe the uh, debate was going to land on GMT plus eight and a half. <laughs> but that's, that's not where it that's No, not where no, it no. It's not the compromise. Yeah. Well, speaking it's of time, uh, we're uh, about at the point where uh, we should open up the floor mm -hmm. to sure. questions and take some from Twitter. Before I do, I'll abuse my moderator uh, privilege by uh, touching on one subject that I haven't heard mm -hmm. uh, from you about, which is the participation, the role, and the issues. Uh, with private industry, the mm. private sector. Yes. How, do, how do companies in Taiwan or abroad uh, play in mm -hmm. this uh, open government innovative strategy? Yeah, so as the digital minister, I'm semi-diplomat to those several sovereign um, yeah. multinational entities um, <laughs> such as Microsoft, Facebook, Google, uh, Apple, and friends. Um, and it's very interesting because they're also struggling with their own legitimacy theory. Uh, they um, just like the internet itself certainly doesn't have a navy or army, but uh, they found themselves being arbiter and organizer mm -hmm. of people's movements, just as the pub we in the public sectors do. Uh, and so I think in many concrete cases, like in Taiwan, we see the use of AI of bots to spread this information. We're in the front line of it. We see using bots to, for example, calm people into buying uh, counterfeit goods, uh, which they pay upon delivery and found that it's broken and there's no, nothing to, to return to. Um, but I'm still an optimist in doing those semi-diplomatic missions because um, early 2000, I, I went through the spam war, which is not a real war <laughs> in a real battlefield, but it is a very complicated issue back then because yeah. people thought email was being destroyed by people who abuse the fact that you can send an email for zero dollars. And so finally, the solution during the spam wars was not from we, the technologists, who implement strong cryptographic measures, nor from large email hosters like Gmail, nor from governments which passed uh, the laws on unsolicited emails, nor from the consumer protection authorities, nor from the educators. It's everybody doing a little bit of it in a coordinated action that increased the cost of spam a little bit uh, along the way. And so it, it reached a point where it doesn't you know, earn anyone anything to send spams. And then we don't see much spams anymore after that. And so this kind of multi-stakeholder open negotiation, it does take time. It took like five years back in the spam war. But we think that it is always better than one single actor dominating uh, the field by basically passing draconian laws that uh, makes everybody else go into the black market or anything like that, but rather in a serious, ongoing discussion of internet governance. Great. Well, that's terrific. Thank you mm -hmm. very much, Audrey. OK, um, the floor is open. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question, uh, I'll ask you. Please uh, briefly identify yourself. Please make sure that it's a, actually a question. Uh, <laughs> and please keep it brief. So the gentleman in the back. Certain types 
about mm -hmm. civic engagement and things like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm sorry, just to repeat mm -hmm. the question to get it on, on the record. Uh, this is Jonathan from the Korea Society asking you about mm -hmm. whether you can gamify some mm -hmm. of these initiatives. Yes, um, so um, there's this project called Holopolis. So the uh, reflection stage uh, technology is called Polis. And Holopolis basically use virtual reality, immersive reality technology to get people in the kind of IMAX theater state of mind and put people into each other's shoes by first starting uh, on the International Space Station, looking at the Earth. It's called the observer effect. Uh, we know as a fact that it makes people better people, uh, just looking at the Earth as a single object and then zooming in into the environmental system and viewing, for example, a construction project from the viewpoint of an endangered animal. Or, for example, uh, I had this conversation with young school children by shrinking my avatar into the size uh, the same as those first graders or second graders. Uh, so in virtual reality, it's much easier to, to make empathy uh, convey empathy in a way that is not just a game, but it's still fun, of course, but really it is a uh, immersive engagement tool that put people really in the place and give voice to like a, a river or a history or indigenous nation that perhaps have no voice to speak on their own, but could be done uh, with the Holopolis project with the virtual and immersive reality. Uh, three people from my team is going very soon to Spain, to Madrid, to prototype the next step of this gamify system uh, in Media Lab Prado. So if you're interested, feel free to join the Holopolis project. Great. Do you have a cat avatar that you can use yes, at home? Yes, I, I actually do. I oh. actually do. <laughs> Fantastic. OK. Uh -huh. Yes, the gentleman in the very back, please. Earl Carr, representing Momentum Advisors, and we're and also an adjunct professor at NYU. Thank you, Minister Tong. I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, I had the privilege of taking a group of graduate students to Taiwan this summer for the first time, and they absolutely loved Taiwan. Um, I had a question. Last year, 2017, there was a large-scale ATM theft case in, in Taiwan where a network of criminals used malware to essentially rob, uh, I think it was like 41 ATM machines mm -hmm, mm -hmm. throughout Taiwan and mm -hmm. stole something like 2.6 million. Mm -hmm. how, how, what are some of the, um, um, how are you dealing, how, how, what kinds of um, projects are you doing to prevent mm -hmm. these types of um, things from happening again? Well, they're an international network, so the fact they're discovering Taiwan says something about our cybersecurity capabilities. Uh, <laughs> I mean, they've been operating everywhere. Um, so um, there is the Cybersecurity Act, which is the, the cornerstone of this, and we thank the legislator for, for a very difficult uh, conversation and finally passing the Cybersecurity Act. <clears throat> and it lists as critical infrastructure uh, the essential services like banks that keeps the society uh, functioning, and it uh, basically says the cybersecurity industry, the cybersecurity community in Taiwan, people who are white hat hackers should have every incentive to remain white hat hackers and contribute to society and occasionally, you know, gets a meeting with the president, for example, and gets cherished as useful and productive members of the society uh, instead of going into the, the criminal route. And so um, the um, Pride, the self-esteem of the cybersecurity uh, community in Taiwan is now at the um, uh, highest point in history, and we make sure that there's sufficient um, HR, uh, like human power, in each uh, critical infrastructure, as well as the ministries that manage these uh, critical infrastructures. We make sure they, they're paid well, they have very good, um, you know, uh, career advancement uh, strategies, and they participate in the international CERT and other communities and provide their contributions. So just a team of hackers who uh, audited my Sandstorm system filed like three CVEs, which is like medals of honor, uh, for, for their work. And so make, just making sure they're respected and we have sufficient training in the college level for people who are interested in defending the, the reality of the cyber plus physical world now. And I think this is really the cornerstone because upon which radical transparency can be built without this foundation, it's impossible. Ambassador Elliott, there's a yes. microphone coming. 
Hi, I'm Susan Elliott, and I'm with the uh, National Committee on American Foreign Policy. My question is, is this is a really interesting and innovative uh, endeavor of the Taiwan government and yourself. Are there other governments who are interested in doing similar things? And have you had collaboration mm -hmm. with other countries and uh, looking forward to seeing more mm -hmm. kinds of uh, digital ministers in countries like the U.S. and others? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, we have a lot of collaborations. Uh, the year before I become digital minister of the 12 months, uh, I spent five of which in Europe. Uh, I work very closely with, for example, the ETA lab, uh, the state lab of the French government, who actually trained uh, activists uh, using this methodology, and then they went off and did Nudibu. Uh, and so uh, it is very interesting relationship, the state lab and the civil society people. And we also take inspiration uh, from Iceland, from Estonia, from Madrid after the 15M and so on. So there's this uh, coalition of democratic cities. There's an EU program uh, called Decent for decentralized um, you know, policy making. And now it's called Decode uh, that brings data in and so on. So we maintain a very strong connection with the both the academic and also the practitioners in municipalities. It's mostly municipality because it's the right amount of people and political willpower to make it happen. That's, that's it. And this June, we also held a workshop in NYC uh, with people from uh, 18F, from USDS, from the New York City government uh, to introduce this methodology. And we're bringing it to Ottawa, I think, uh, this November. And we're making a curriculum together. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me take a question from Twitter. Uh, this oh. is from yes. uh, Denali Pack in from Alaska. The beyond. <laughs> uh, can, can established entrenched power truly concede? to emergent changes uh, won't establish budgets, careers, fiefdoms, reinforce, resist, and deny self-organized solutions. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, internet itself was like that. I mean, there was a lot of established interests. I'm sure that here there's AT&T and, and friends uh, who I think opposed the very idea of installing a plug-in to your uh, phone system. And, and so had that not been allowed, this whole idea of modem would not be possible. And without a modem, there is no internet. So there are some preconditions upon which that the established system need to see that this emergent system is complementing but not reinforcing their uh, hierarchical power. But on the other hand, I'm, my philosophy of voluntary association says before the career public service is ready for any of it, I certainly don't go to the Ministry of Defense and say, starting tomorrow, you're going to do things my way. And that, that's not my philosophy. So they only come to me when they see the other danger or the risk of not engaging is larger than the potential fear and certain of doubt that they have internally of engagement. And that is the philosophy of participation offices. We're certainly not saying we're replacing the existing uh, establishment overnight. We're mostly saying like Buckminster Fuller <coughs> is, is want to do and want to say is that you, you don't fix or hack or patch an old system. You make new systems that in some cases make the old system obsolete. But it is a natural progression. It is not by fighting with the existing system. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK. So uh, career uh, mm. bureaucrats could be made obsolete, but you're not going to fight with them. That's exactly right. <laughs> Over time. I got, I got out just in time. <laughs> yeah. OK, more questions. Yes, the lady right here. I'm from Taiwan, and now I'm a visiting scholar in New York. So I have a pro I have a question for you because right now, the news that Google they reach they plan to return to China market, mm -hmm. and they already have a, like a um, dragonfly. Yeah, the research, dragonfly. The research, mm -hmm. yeah, because they're sensitive some keyword like a student protest or mm -hmm. human rights. Mm -hmm censor the keyword mm -hmm. and also to tracking the browsing results mm -hmm. applied which which number to research that mm -hmm. the sensitive concept mm -hmm. so what do you think as the freedom is can be training for the business or benefit mm -hmm. for the big company like google mm -hmm. yeah. well many Googlers, who are my friends, are very concerned about it. Uh, they've brought it up in their internal governance uh, mechanisms. Um, 
being their company business, of course, I cannot comment or review <laughs> what, what they actually is, is going through. But I, I will use an example like when I uh, started working with Apple. It is a liaison with the open source community. And back at time, uh, for anything related to basic language research or even AI research or whatever, Apple doesn't publish anything. And, and they don't actually get a lot of credibility or trust from the academic community of the things that they're producing or how they're producing in a very basic sense of the language, the programming language they use. And after quite a few years, um, we, the people who work as liaisons and the people who work within Apple, eventually convinced um, the top management that it is actually to their benefit if they work more in the open and more to share their research results with the research community of programming languages and artificial intelligence, which is kind of the direction uh, Apple is taking now. So I think it all boils down to the individuals. Um, so uh, just to come back a little bit about, I'm not saying you know the career public servants, the people are made obsolete. I'm just saying the hierarchical power structure is being supplemented and a little bit you know rendered obsolete. But people are still people, and people can act. Uh, in their conscience, in the kind of values they want to uphold, and they collectively define um, the, the company or the brand that they work with. I think one of the great mismatch of our time is that we use the words that we use on people, like we say, attract investment on nouns that are not people, our institutions, our collective fictions, our brand. And we treat people as if they're functional entities like human resource and, and things like that. So if people within a institution can think of themselves more as in the individual actors and organize and make their thoughts known as many friends of mine in Google is, is now doing. I think there is every hope that the governance system still within that institution uh, will deliberate and will change uh, its course for the better of the common will of the people working there. Let me follow up on a good question yeah. about Google in China yes. with a slightly philosophical question, sure. which is that uh, for a generation mm -hmm. there's been a conviction in the West that uh, freedom is an essential condition for mm -hmm. Uh, real innovation. The mm. scientific method is founded on uh, the sanctity of facts, the sharing of data, mm -hmm. the integrity of the data, etc. Mm -hmm. And that led to a widespread assumption that, for example, in, in China, in mainland China, that only with uh, political openness and reform mm -hmm. could innovation, science, development, and even business genuinely flourish. That premise has been called into question and is uh, debated now uh, with a lot of evidence suggesting that even while uh, the political system is uh, becoming more controlled, uh, innovation, development, research is flourishing uh, within that uh, st political stricture. Where do you stand on that sort of debate and what mm. is your experience uh, telling you uh, mm. is likely to uh, be the future? Um, so first, I think innovation means very different things to many different people. Uh, I mean, the common dictionary definition is just it has to be new, it has to be replicable, and, and that's it, right? Uh, so what counts as innovation, I think, is very different, as I mentioned, very different tracks. In Taiwan, when we talk about innovation, we always say that it must to be the, for the social good, for the common good of everyone. If you make innovation in one particular domain to the sacrifice of you know, other domains, like focus on one sustainable goal to the detriment of the other goals, we don't call it innovation, we call it a mistake. Uh, so, <laughs> no, seriously, <laughs> this is just common political language in Taiwan. Uh, on, on the other hand, um, in many other jurisdictions, in many other systems, people may just call the linear progress, innovation, uh, and ignoring the massive externalities that it can cause to the society and the environment. So what qualifies as innovation is different in the different academic and political communities. I still think that open innovation, uh, the ethos that the internet itself um, 
embodies um, is not entirely gone uh, in, in PRC. For example, the Great Firewall, they still allow people to collaborate on GitHub, which is the most important uh, open source uh, collaboration ground recently acquired by Microsoft. Uh, so basically, what this says is that if it cuts the connection to the one of the greatest nexus of open innovation, it is to the detriment of whatever innovation means there as well. The innovators there still have a strong enough Mm -hmm. uh, societal mandate so that they cannot actually shut GitHub off. And I think so it's not as, you know, polarized or dystopian at this point, but of course we'll pay close attention. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, yes, the lady with the black uh, dress. You. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Leah von Martius. I'm at Columbia University representing the um, student-led uh, think tank called European Horizons. We just opened a chapter in um, Taipei University. By the way, so what I'm, I'm really interested in is that obviously there's a certain, um, so I mean the, the, the models that you're um, proposing, which are incredibly interesting, um, are sort of um, proposing a new form of democracy, a new form of participation, a more open form of participation. Um, but it is also known that there exists a certain digital gap, right, with everything um, between the offline and online world, and particularly between more developed and less developed countries, although I hate to use that, that dichotomy. Um, there is, of course, a danger that um, why the countries that can afford the infrastructure and, and the knowledge and the education of society to participate in this kind of digital and more open kind of democracy, um, where does it leave the countries that cannot afford, because there is an upfront investment mm -hmm, necessary, mm -hmm. where does it leave the countries that cannot afford this? Mm -hmm. And are there, because of the, uh, when you mentioned the, um, the collaborative partnerships, you were mentioning France and, and Canada, which are very developed countries, um, where does it leave the countries that mm -hmm. are not there yet? And how can that can can partnerships be established to to improve that? It is a great question. Um, so uh, last November, I believe, <coughs> I spoke about this very topic uh, in the United Nations Internet Governance Forum in UN Geneva. Uh, because of certain passport issues, uh, I had to send my robotic avatar uh, into the <laughs> Internet Governance Forum. So for the rule of proceeding, they're just watching a video, uh, except it's recorded two seconds ago, and that has a camera with it. Um, in any case, through telepresence, um, I think the panel I attended was on landlocked and least developed and also small island uh, countries, which doesn't have a strong internet exchange point where it costs a lot to exchange information to Facebook or to Google or to any of the data centers. And certainly those companies are not going to uh, set up data centers anytime soon on those small islands or landlocked uh, countries. So I think it is pretty unique that um, internet is designed with these scenarios in mind originally because it's like post-nuclear you know, resilience network. And so uh, many of the tools of the early internet, like the email, functions perfectly even if you're cut off from the wider internet, you only have a very thin connection. That was indeed the case during the Occupy. <laughs> during the Occupy, the, the entire 3G and HSDPA channel were so saturated that we have to rely on intranet technologies with very limited exchange capacity to the outside to run most of the communication network and collective decision uh, in the occupied area uh, around the legislative UN. And so, which is why we think that the technologies we're proposing all based on the idea of decentralized web, all based on the ideas that it can run on very low cost Raspberry Pi level uh, hardware, open hardware, it could also be of help uh, to landlocked or uh, small island countries that basically want to set up virtual town halls or about collaborative governance system by linking the campuses together without paying for a very uh, expensive uh, outbound link uh, to the greater or larger internet by basically leveraging the latest development on distributed ledger, decentralized web, and things like that. So technologically, we already have a prototype of a solution. And we're, of course, uh, very much willing to work with our uh, partners in many other countries and perhaps UNDP, why not, uh, to try to pilot this kind of um, governance systems. Great, great. Yeah. Thank you very much. The lady right in front of the former questioner had a question. The other lady in black. Yes. Uh, I also have a finance question. When um, either individuals or groups or countries come to you for a solution and you come up with a solution, I'm concerned or wonder who pays for those quality air quality controls or the helicopters or all the solutions you come up with. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, the air quality sensors, uh, they are done by um, private sector companies with a social mission. Uh, in, I was just visiting Edinburgh, so they called uh, social enterprises uh, there. Uh, but here, I mean, it could be B Corps or whatever. They're basically uh, for-profit entities with a clear social mission to make something happen to solve a sustainable development goal uh, challenge. And I'm also the minister uh, with the mandate to work with social innovators, entrepreneurs, and anyone who want to make a business out of solving a environmental or social need, and we SDG index their work and put it on the dashboard that I don't have time to show. So basically, we m play matchmakers to people with environmental or social needs and build sustainable business models for the companies who are interested in solving these needs to thrive and also export it. For example, the Taiwan Water Corporation recently, through the presidential hackathon, established a relationship with AI researchers to detect the water leakages early so that they don't have to you know, wait a year and a half before repairing a new leakage point. They shrunk the time to, uh, by tenfold. Uh, because we SDG index this work, because we build a sustainable um, business model out of it, so the team is now in New Zealand because they did not have a water shortage problem because of climate change they now do. And so uh, the team was just there. And it shows enormous trust to just share data about water pressure, about water quality this way. And so, of course, the taxpayers in New Zealand probably pay for the initial cost of producing these data, but it is entirely a voluntary association because there is a business to be made there as well. Great, great. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, there's a lady with a scarf right there. Hi, my, na my name is Charlie Su. Um, I'm from Taiwan and um, work and live here for a, a little bit. Um, my, I think this is an interesting you know, platform, very transparent. Um, I think uh, my question is, what's the percentage of the citizens have involved in this mm. platform, do you think? Mm -hmm. And second of all, um, I think uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Russell, um, he asked this question about um, for the senior people or you know, old, mm -hmm. older people mm -hmm. or uh, lower educated people there, mm -hmm. you know, you answer that question, you can mm -hmm. approach to them. Yeah. I guess the, prob the, the question I have is, what it's not, if it's not a, a specific issue, it's just a general issue, if, how can they express their um, opinion through yes. your platform? Yes, so uh, the first question, uh, the national e-participation platform, or the joint platform, has 5 million users uh, in a country with 23 million people. So it's a sizable population. Um, the, the age uh, and activity map looks like this. Uh, if you're in a college or if you're in a senior high school, there's a lot of participation. And if you're retired, there's a lot of participation because people with more time on their hands. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and so we're, we're not seeing much <laughs> exclusion, uh, you know, um, domestically and across different counties. But it is true that it's mostly national issues. And if it's local issue, it has to solicit national interest. That is why the two local issues we dealt with are both in popular tourist destinations or in, uh, marine national parks because it's, uh, everybody wants to visit there and so it is to the welfare of everyone. So we're now uh, working through the second issue you mentioned through what we call the regional uh, revitalization plan. I don't actually know how to translate the function, so I'll just translate with whatever. Uh, so the regional revitalization uh, plan is basically saying in each town, in each uh, county of around 50K to 100K uh, of people, they build their own self-governance system by making use of this e-participation platform. We provide it for free, but mostly for archival and indexing and education purposes. They still run with analog tools uh, to collect what people feel, and, and we don't call it deliberative democracy, which is called, you know, uh, with, with people, right? <laughs> so, so, so just, just you know, sitting down and having a chat. And so basically, this idea of regional innovation is our next step of scaling out. It is taking the same tools, same, um, basically, culture, the same ideas, same archival, and, and same auto level of automation, but empowering the young people in those different uh, townships and counties to be able to co collectively determine the identity of their uh, neighborhood and build an ecosystem out of it so that they will wish to remain and identify with that particular place. And so it is an instrumental part of the regional revitalization tool, but the uh, regional revitalization plan comprises of many other ministries as well. Thank you, Andre.
We're coming uh, perilously close to the end yeah. of our allotted time, and mm -hmm. so I think I'm going to let the internet have the last word. Okay. Uh, we get a <laughs> question symbolic, from <laughs> online. Um, you're an, a champion and a trailblazer in uh, harnessing uh, digital technology mm -hmm. and innovation uh, for the benefit of society. Uh, can you comment a bit on the dangers uh, from the use of social media mm. and uh, other uh, digital technologies for political disruption, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for uh, political uh, efforts that undermine democracy mm -hmm. as uh, we have seen mm -hmm. in the case of the 2016 election mm -hmm. here in the United States? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so um, disinformation campaigns, computational propaganda, precision persuasion, these are a reality of our times. Taiwan's uh, concerted effort to wor work with uh, disinformation uh, is somewhat unique, certainly in Asia, in the sense that we don't sacrifice anyone's uh, freedom of speech uh, in our responses. Instead, what we built was a rapid response system from each ministry and every agency. Nowadays, when we uh, our system detects that there is a dis is disinformation campaign starting within hours, like three hours or four hours, <laughs> there is a clarification or a point-to-point -point response from the responsible ministries on the homepage of the administration. And then we partner with civil society friends who are not paid by the government for sure, and they can also correct the government's uh, mistakes. Uh, and they set up independent fact-checking organizations that are not just publishing written reports, but actually have bots, for example, that you can add as a friend on the WhatsApp-like uh, setting. And if you see something that you wonder whether it's disinformation or not, you can just send it to that bot, which does a crowdsource validated audit trail of fact-checking for you and let you know that whether this is has been clarified or not. So at the end, what we're trying to do here is to um, using the basic education system and lifelong education system to have a sense of media literacy and critical thinking in people. Because back in the authoritarian days, it's very easy to people to accept one standard answer if it's printed in one font or spoken in some authoritarian voice. And this is what this information is piggybacking on. It is basically printing with that font, with that voice, just not with the same content, and trying to get into people's mind, kind of virus of mind, a mimetic um, backdoor, if you will. But now what we're doing now with this kind of real-time clarification and multi-stakeholder consultation that's very public is that if you sit down and listen with people with different ideas for a long enough time, it builds an immune system, inoculation in, in the human brain, so that one cannot be motivated by device the PR campaigns in the future because you have considered the different positions of the stakeholders. So this is the culture we're bringing to the table. And we're also bringing all the different automated reply, uh, detection, and and uh, evaluation systems to the table, and we connect with the international fact-checking uh, organizations and similar endeavors in an effort to make this information more like, you know, a, a distraction rather than a serious yeah. uh, problem undermining the democracy. Great, great. Well, Audrey Tang, um, I can't speak for everybody. Uh, I will say I feel like my IQ has gone up by several points <laughs> just <laughs> listening to you today. Uh, but I can speak for everyone in saying thank you and particularly uh, telling you that I think we all found what you have shared with us today uh, not only interesting and not only informative, uh, but also inspirational. And I want to let you know that you have a, an open welcome at the Asia Society. We very much admire and appreciate both your personal uh, courage, uh, something that we uh, all respect, um, but also the professional work that you're doing, which is clearly on the cutting edge of where societies uh, need to go in order to uh, build faith in public institutions and to refit them for the challenges of the digital age. Uh, we're living in now. So please join me in thanking. Thank you so much.